Welcome along to another episode of the Play On Podcast, your weekly instalment of all things Scottish football. I'm David Simmons, as always, delighted to be joined by Anthony Brown and Stephen Commons. Make sure you stay tuned for the next hour as we look back on the weekend Scottish football and highlights, the action and the key talking points that was happening in the Scottish football scene. On tonight's show, we are going to be discussing the David Martindale journey from zero to hero. He is in the final. He has achieved a unbelievable amount of success in the short time that he's been in charge at Livingston Stephen we're going to come to you first with this question um, he's going to have to convince the SFA this week that he's fit and proper to manage Livingston after criminal activities in his past he was convicted for drug trafficking in 2006 he spent well he was resulted in him getting a six and a half year jail term he's now rehabilitated he's got a degree at uni um, he's a successful footballing boss now um, does he deserve a second chance? Absolutely um, I think we, we've spoken about David Martindale on and off a couple of times over the last few weeks um, and kind of the main talking point when it comes to David Martindale is always oh he's a bit of a dodgy character a bit of a dodgy dealer but I think it, obviously in the short term that he's been in charge of Livingston on his own I mean the, the success they've had is absolutely unbelievable it's, it's ridiculous the levels that kind of he's got them playing at at this moment in time um, but also, he's been a massive part of the success that they've had up till now as well. So if you look at where they've come from in the last four or five years, he's always been in the background. He's always been there helping out, and there was always a bit of kind of dubiety about him because of because of his background. And a lot of people were kind of whispering about it, but nobody had a reason to kind of talk about his history and, and things that he had done in the past until he got the top job, really. Um, but the the one thing I think we spoke about this last week, and the one thing that I would say about about David Martindale particularly is, he is a perfect example of someone who is very remorseful about what what his the, the, his previous wrongdoings in the past, and he talks openly about it. He'll, he'll answer any question that's put to him. He, he gives an honest like recollection of what went on. He doesn't try and shy away. He doesn't try to blame it on anybody else. He doesn't try to blame it on circumstances in his life. He faces up and says, I did something wrong, but that shouldn't define the rest of his life or the rest of his career. So, I mean, you would really hope that if the SFA are, are seeing him this week, it's been delayed and delayed and delayed. But if they finally get to sort of sit in front of each other, you would really hope that the SFA would embrace all these things that, Scottish sport and Scottish football is, is supposed to stand for where it, it, it shouldn't matter about your background, your history, your skin colour, your religion. It should all be down to are you suitable to take that, that job and to, to run that group of young men? And I, I don't see any argument that for anybody that could say that David Martindale is not getting the best out of that group of guys. And I'm pretty sure if you ask to any of the players... I mean, look at that that Celtic game during the week, for an example. He made, I think he made eight or nine changes to the team. He's brought in guys who probably haven't been playing for him in the weeks gone by. And it, you didn't see any drop-off in their performance. And that, to me, shows a group of players that are really behind what this manager is trying to do. So I, I, I don't really have, usually have any strong opinions on any club out with hearts, really, when it comes to stuff like this. But I really do hope that a guy like David Martindale is given the opportunity to to be a success and, and to do something really special. Absolutely. Anthony, what's your view on this? Does, does he deserve a second chance? We've heard Stevens. I mean, he always does come across well in, in television interviews he's done. He has owned up to what he did. He makes no sort of qualms about the mistakes that he made in his past. Does he deserve a second chance and should he be given the, the job full-time going forward now at Livingston? Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that he deserves a chance at redemption, if that seems to be the, the buzzword in this situation. Um, I think you'd have to be, have a pretty cold heart to deny him this opportunity. I mean, I know there are certain people who won't approve of what he's done in the past, but I think anybody who's paid attention to how he's gone about his business, certainly since he got the Livingston job on a caretaker basis initially, will detect that he's genuinely remorseful. I mean, you read that article with you and Murray a couple of months ago, and that was really impressive. I thought he came across really well, and you thought this is a genuine guy who wants to make good of his life and put his um, indiscretions, if you like, in the past. Um, and again, yesterday he was in the papers previewing the game and again sort of touching on his past and talking about how he had to tell his eight-year-old daughter about his past because now that he was becoming a public figure, she was able to Google him. 
and he was worried that she would find out about his dark past via the internet. So, I mean, he's clearly a guy who wants to leave his past in the past. I think it's pretty evident that he's a, a decent guy who's obviously gone down a wrong path. He's, he's held his hands up and admitted he's done wrong. He's embarrassed by it. He's shown genuine contrition. So I'd, I think anybody who's been paying close attention to this story will have no qualms about him becoming the Livingston manager going forward. Um, I understand, obviously, there will be certain... I'm sure there are people out there that think a guy like this shouldn't be near a football club, but to be honest, those people are not my type of people. I have to say, people that aren't willing to give people a chance to turn things around and make amends. I mean, the, the aside from whether he deserves a second chance in a football context, he's certainly shown that he's a very capable manager in the first couple of months. We've spoken about this before. Sometimes the caretaker manager can get a little bounce at the start and then it fizzles out eventually. Um, I think everybody's sort of hoping this one continues. It's just been a remarkable story. And I think the, the thing that I was thinking about, which uh, ties in with a lot of other managers in Scotland just now, is Martindale's pulling this remarkable run of form out the bag at a time when pretty much no other team in Scotland, with the exception of Rangers, is showing any form of consistency. Every other team in the country seems to be in some form of disarray, mild crisis, it just is unable to get any positivity or genuine rhythm going. And here you have Rangers and Livingston as the only two teams in the country who you would say are enjoying genuine harmony on a relatively sustained basis. Yeah, absolutely. And since we last spoke, uh, Martin Dale's had a bit of an eventful week. Um, we'll touch on, obviously, his path to the cup final very shortly. But last Wednesday, um, he held Celtic at home to a 2-2 draw. It was a, a bit of a snowy evening at Ammon Vale, if you like, um, Stephen, that's that's another another points drop for Neil Lennon, though, isn't it? I think you have to look at it that way, to be honest. I mean, I know it's it's a bit harsh on Livingston because they've been on great form, and Celtic haven't really. Or, or, again, the question marks are always there. This is this is what I'm saying. Like we, we talked about this again last week in terms of Rangers. Rangers are, uh, from our point of view, as, as kind of commentators on football. Rangers are a boring team because they don't give you anything to talk about, whereas Celtic consistently have these have these blips. And I mean, again, you could, if you're the the biggest Neil Lennon supporter in the world, you could argue that obviously, given the fact that all these players were missing, he, he then gets some of them back. They didn't train full time, and but I mean, I just don't. There, there is no excuses really in terms of in terms of the performance levels like you can, you can talk for days and days about the dubai debacle the the boardroom problems the the rumors that are coming out about Neil Lennon's position but at the end of the day they're a football club they're judged on what they do on the pitch and far too many times this season they've been miles miles short of where they should be yeah, I'm just reading some of the, the messages that are coming through. Hi to Joe. He says our justice system is based on rehabilitation. Uh, he has rehabilitated himself. He should be commended for it. Um, so I'm, I'm just, sorry, I was just reading through a lot of the messages that were coming through there, all in sort of favour of David Martindale being given the role on a, on a full-time basis. Um, we, we talked, obviously, at quite a lot of extent last week about Neil Lennon um, and we thought, possibly coming at this show this week, that he might not be in charge. That result on Wednesday night, Anthony, that, that meant that Celtic had gone four consecutive league games without a win for the first time in 21 years. Um, there's been an uproar by the supporters at Celtic, but yet Neil Lennon's still surviving. Do you think that's maybe a sign that they're just going to keep holding him to the end of the season? Um, it's, it's starting, I don't know. I mean, I think we've all agreed that he's past the point of no return. I don't think there's any way you can turn things around here. I think it's just a matter of time. It's probably a case of can Celtic get the guy in that they want, whoever that may be. And I dare say the problem is they don't know who they want at the moment or the ideal candidate isn't jumping up and sort of in front of them. I see Frank Lampard obviously becoming available today and going in his favourite with the bookmakers, but I don't know. I just don't see that one happening. I think if you've just managed Chelsea and that's your team, Frank Lampard isn't necessarily crying out for the money, he doesn't necessarily need to go straight back into a job. I would think from being manager of Chelsea, the club that he's been mostly associated with throughout his playing career and now as a manager, he would see Celtic as a major step down. I may be wrong, but I would imagine that 
that wouldn't be a job he would be looking to go at at the moment, particularly the, in Celtic's current state. The, the um, thing is, sorry to interrupt, Tony, but the, the, the thing is with, with Celtic's current situation, the way things are and, and with the, all the issues and around the PR of the club and people are, like, fans are quite rightly up in arms about the fact that they're not getting any communication from the club. They Because of what's going on, it's like a siege mentality within Celtic. And uh, you can tell that by the fact that the journalists are getting nothing. The journalists are they're throwing mud at a wall and seeing what will stick. The the mirror had had Rafa Benitez as a stone cold favourite. He was definitely going to get Celtic. I've approached him. He's definitely going to get the job. Literally four hours later, Gilan Balague, who's obviously a well renowned Spanish journalist, works for the BBC has a very good relationship with Benitez, comes out absolutely just kiboshes it. It's not, that is not happening. But, so you can see from even from from what you would call Celtic-minded journalists, guys who you know throughout the years have, have had good connections and good information coming out of the club. There's nothing. There is nothing coming out, which is exactly why a lazy... Per, like a, a lazy idea, like Frank Lampard, Lampard versus Gerrard again. Oh, that that makes great copy. Let's just put that. Let's run with that as a story, and the, the bookies will pick up with that. That I think to me just emphasises the fact that nothing's coming out of Celtic, and you could argue that that's probably a good thing that they're not leaking their business all over the newspapers and potentially costing themselves more money when it does come time to to re- replace the manager. But we've talked about this on this program for months now. Who's going to replace Neil Lennon? Who's going to replace Neil Lennon? The Celtic board are absolutely, you can obviously are not in any rush to do so. So the journalists and and the, and the bookies can make lists for as long as they want. It's not going to happen until Celtic actually put the green or the white flag up and say, "Sorry, guys, we we made a mistake here. We're going to replace Neil Lennon." And I don't see that happening now until at least the end of the season. I don't see any reason why they would they would. Bring in a new manager at this moment in time. What have they got to play for? They're, they're 23 points behind. The, the Scottish Cup might, be, might not even go ahead this season. Why would they why, why would they replace a manager unless they were unless they had the ideal candidate in front of them? Then why well, would they take a gamble? That's it. They've, they've inadvertently given themselves time to pick their successor now. They've basically got five months to think about their successor and whether he becomes available in the next couple of months, they may decide to go for him. But I dare say they'll probably look at this and say, from the board perspective, they're probably thinking we would rather Neil Lennon continued in the position than promote somebody as caretaker. Because I dare say Lennon probably is a better bet than whoever else is waiting in the wings to step up and become caretaker, whether that was John Kennedy or Gavin Strachan or whoever. So they're probably thinking, look, Lenny can do the job for the next couple of months until such time as we can find who we want. Um, I don't like talking like that because fundamentally Neil Lennon is still in a job and who knows, he may actually still be, I would be very surprised, but you never know, he might actually start next season as Celtic manager. I dare say there would be an uproar if that happened, but they, they probably will be thinking, we've got nothing more to lose now, the league is gone. Um there is no rush to sack the manager just now because we can't really do anything in the next couple of months. Let's just let things tick over just now. Hope that we can just keep it relatively calm until such point as the man that they want to go for for next season becomes available or, or until they can home. I, I dare say they probably don't know who they want at this moment. That I would... But see, see, to me, that that's not, not acceptable. That is not acceptable for a board. I mean, again, we talked about this. We talked about this in October. Like at that point, I was saying, "Well, it's it's absolutely scandalous that if Celtic don't have a plan in place now, and and, and we're now what three three months further down the line, and people are genuinely believing the fact that Celtic don't have a plan. Celtic don't have a a, a person in mind. Or th- this is what we said last week about Brendan Rodgers leaving Celtic, like last season." He left Celtic and went to Leicester, and, and people would maybe look at that and go, "It's a bit of a, a bit strange timing." He's left Celtic kind of in the lurch when they were looking for this ninth title, and he's not got, really got anything to play for at Leicester. But that time was invaluable for him that he went to Leicester, and I think the board were fully aware of that. Celtic should learn from that and look at that situation and go, "Well, why can we not do the same thing? Why have they not identified a candidate?" six months ago when people were seeing that this was going wrong. Why why did they not start that process then? Have a short list of five, six, seven names. You're not telling me a club the size of Celtic cannot find someone that they could say to them tomorrow, come and manage our club, and they, and they would get somebody better than Neil Lennon. 
Maybe I mean, that Ross is on it and they've got cold feet in the last couple of weeks. <sighs> Well, that's something we'll come to a bit later on in the show but there is loads of comments coming in thanks for them all all I want is if you're a Celtic fan who who do you want in charge it's all fine saying well oh, the bookies have now come out and said oh Frank Lampard's top of the list or Rafa Benitez is rumoured to come in it's all the press as a fan if you're watching this a Celtic fan who do you want in charge if you're not a Celtic fan who do you think would do the job at Celtic get in touch and let us know what you think hi to Daniel who's been in touch uh, we're going to lose the Champions League spot if they don't make that change I don't agree with that. I, I, I don't think. I, I still think Celtic could hobble over the line with what they've got. They've got a good squad. They've got a good squad. Wow. Like, these are not bad players. Look at the. It's, it's the it's the the bones of the squad that they had last season. Like the the big tree, the big difference goalkeeper. Like they're, they're, as much as Barkas has had people screaming out at him and sort of saying he's not good enough. To me, he hasn't made like masses and masses of glaring errors from his performances that he has done so there is something dramatically wrong but it isn't the fact that these guys are not good enough because that that just doesn't make any sense you see this time after time at football clubs that sometimes the message is if you continue to go to the well with a certain style of management which again I don't know for definite but I would suggest that Neil Lennon is the kind of guy that he he likes to crack skulls he likes to kind of like ruffle feathers, but you can only do that so many times, and then that's got a shelf life. Unless you reinvent yourself and try and do things different ways, players will eventually get bored of the message. I, I, I don't. I, I mean, as as horrible as, as it is to say, if I was a Celtic fan, I would still be confident that you could put you could put the tea lady in charge of the team for the rest of the season, and we'd still get second place. But and I bet that might be disrespectful to Hibs and Aberdeen, but. As you said, Tony, they they have had their own issues. They've had their own problems this season. Every club has. So, I mean, Celtic are still comfortably going to be the second best team in the country. But is that good enough for them? Is, are, they, are they quite happy to just accept, oh, well, if, even if we finish five or six points ahead of Aberdeen? That's just not acceptable. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting carried away with some of the, the messages that are coming through. I to David Kelly. We've got a decent squad. Not a good one. We don't have coaches. That's the issue. Now, if you look at what's happened across at Ibrox, so they put Steven Gerrard in charge, which was obviously a huge gamble at the time. He's not got a great... I mean, it might have taken him, what, three seasons to get to the stage they're at now? But he wasn't a great experienced manager, if you like. A great experienced name in football, player-wise, absolutely. Should Celtic maybe look more so down that route rather than, like, say, Rafa Benitez, who's sat in the dugout for years and years. Maybe someday a name that's getting thrown about tonight, Damien Duff, Sean Maloney. Someone even said, dare I say, Scott Brown. Someone who is a young, thirsty, ready to hit the ground running kind of manager that, that might come in there at Celtic with a decent budget. Recruitment is a key thing. And like David says here as well, you need to have the good coaches on board, which I believe Sean Maloney is extremely well thought of in that in that department. Like say Damien Duff, who's already been in as well. Is, I'm, I'm a, maybe talking rubbish here, Anthony, or do you see where I'm going with maybe that younger, thirsty, or not had that sort of high level of a club yet? to come in on board, maybe like what they, they did with Gerard at Rangers? I, I mean, it's fun. you can go any way you want with a managerial appointment. It's only a good appointment if it ends up being successful and you just don't know how it's going to pan out. Maloney could be the next Martin O'Neill. He could be an absolutely hugely successful Celtic manager or he could end up being more a Ronnie Dyla type. We just don't know and we won't know until he gets that chance. I mean, I think Celtic are in a position now where Neil Lennon's stock is so low that a lot of supporters, there's going to be this element of people who want the Brendan Rodgers, the blockbuster appointment, no matter whether it's a logical one or not. People are, Brendan Rodgers is the benchmark of uh, recent Celtic managers and there will be people who want another big gun like a Rafa Benitez or even an Eddie Howe if he's perceived as a big gun. I like that. Now you mentioned it, I like the idea of a Maloney or a Damien Duff type. It's obviously not going to be a box office appointment in terms of shifting season tickets and all that, if that's something that Celtic are interested in. But there's n if Neil Lennon became the Celtic manager with no experience as a manager behind him, so there is no reason that Sean Maloney shouldn't be able to do it. Um, it just, uh, I mean, if Celtic are going for a proper rebuild, then maybe they do want to look at a guy like that who's starting afresh and will bring a totally new way of thinking in. He's not going to necessarily... Um, he's not going to come in with the gravitas of a Benitez or 
for Brendan Rodgers, but he knows Celtic, which is a big thing. I've always said when Celtic or Rangers or the bigger clubs in Scotland are recruiting, whether it's a manager or a player, having that knowledge and the experience of the club is a big thing because expect, expectations are so high. And people coming in from out, outside, they may have a good CV, but sometimes they get a bit taken aback by the size of the clubs in Scotland and just the, the intensity and the passion. So I think with somebody like Maloney, you wouldn't have that issue. He knows what's expected at Celtic. And he's obviously a guy who's highly thought of in coaching circles. Roberto Martinez has him on his uh, with Belgium. Um, so, yeah, I mean, any appointment at a club at Celtic size is a huge gamble. But, so it depends what way Celtic are wanting to go. But certainly Maloney is one worth exploring, in my view. Yeah, um, I mean, a lot of people in the comments here are saying it's all down to the coaching. I mean, I think our last comment or said the exact same as well. There's rumours at the moment that West Ham, uh, they're going to put in a, a high offer for uh, Odson Edward, around about £35 million, around about the same ballpark as Leicester City are going to offer as well. Is it worth Celtic taking that for him? and then reinvesting rather than spending £4.5 million on a goalkeeper that's not going to cut the mustard? Is it worth investing in a proper structure from the managerial side to your assistant, to your good coaches, Stephen? Again, Sammy, this comes from... This is something that should be decided by a manager. This should be decided by a, a manager, a director of football, a, a team that's in place and, and is going to be in place for the next two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight seasons. You know what I mean? It's uh, uh, selling your selling the prize China in, in any team is a gamble because I mean he's going to go at some point, Odson Edward, and and if you if they think thirty five million is is peak price and that's what they're going to get from him and they're not going to get anything more, then in the form that he's in. Like some, someone was saying at the weekend, Connor Gold, Connor Goldson has scored the same amount of goals from open play as Odson Edward this season. So it's it, it goes without saying that if they can get that sort of money for a player like him, they should they should probably do it at this moment in time. But the thing that would worry me if I was a Celtic supporter would be how do they spend that? How do they spend that thirty five million? Because this season it doesn't look like their recruitment's been very good, and if 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 their structure is that. Nicky Hammond does all the signings. Nicky Hammond does, then fine. Then they probably could reinvest that thirty-five million at the end of this season and, and put plans in place. But until you've got a manager in place, or until you know where the club is going, how can you purchase players for that system, that that specific manager, how they want to play? It's it's an impossible task. They just can't do it. I'd be yeah. astonished if anybody was willing to pay thirty-five million for Edward That's, at the moment. I, I think you'd be lucky to get half that. And I think Celtic would probably bite your hand off if they got offered fifteen, twenty million. One, he's, two, he's three, a great four. Player, obviously, when he's on his game, but. Five the last five messages said I'd snap the hand off for thirty five million. Uh, I'll drive him down the road myself for thirty five million. Uh, we wouldn't even get over fifteen million. And uh, so yeah, I, exactly what you're saying, Tony. The, the the viewers are agreeing with that. I'd say a lot in this window. Uh, Rangers centre half score more, like what you said, Stephen. Uh, take the money, start to rebuild. We've got Griffiths and Ayeti up there as well. So um, yeah, everybody kind of agreeing. Um, we got a bit off topic though. We got involved in Celtic there because we we're talking about the result, uh, the draw at. Livingston during the week. Um, back to David Martindale and Livingston. Uh, they are through the final for only the second time in their history. I mean, that takes it to now, if you like, 12 games unbeaten now for David Martindale. We, we keep, we, we, it's weird because when he first came in, we were a wee bit sceptical about David Martindale. I mean, he, he literally has went from the unknown to a hero now, Stephen, hasn't he? It's actually only 11 games, David. But oh, I do apologise. The only reason I know it is because Livingston probably did the tweet of the year when they when, they, right. beat, when they, drew, they drew with Celtic they put out a massive 10 in a row That's which, right. which I thought was incredible from a team, a team like that but um, yeah I mean again it's like it's like uh, everything that it's all, like all the cards are falling into place at the same at the right time for them so they've gone on this amazing run they've got to a final I mean I think when you asked for predictions last week we both said that we expected it to be a Hibs and Livingston final. So Livingston beating St Mirren and, and getting to the final isn't a massive upset or or, or against the, the, the run of play. Or, but you've still got to take your hat off to a club the size. Like whether it, be, it would have been Livingston or St Mirren, a club that size getting to a final is, is fantastic for them. And, and it would be a great day out for the fans if they were allowed at that time. But 
I, I just think St Johnston versus Livingston it is literally toss a coin. Anyone could win that, and for either of those clubs to get a bit of silverware, uh, I think I think it's great. It's great for Scottish football to kind of spread it around a bit. And um, it, I mean, as much as it was record breaking and everybody was given massive plaudits to Celtic for winning all these trophies, it wasn't good PR or great for, for Scottish football in general. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't really bode well for the the reputation that Scotland has, even just down south, of like it's Rangers, Celtic, and then literally no one else matters. Nobody gives a like even Rangers and Celtic get disrespected by by the English media, and so so I think other teams coming coming up and and winning competitions is is great. And and if that's David Martindale and, and Livingston, then I think that's potentially. Well, you, you, David Martindale will hope that it's not the end, but it's 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 a a good end to the story this season. If they were to get that and I get a bit of silverware in the bag, finish top six, he gets approved by the SFA, and it, ride off into the sunset. It's it's a, it's a good story if if it happens. Yeah, so we we know that Livingston are obviously in the final. The other semi final at hand of the weekend was obviously St Johnston against Hibs. St Johnston are one game away from winning their first ever League Cup, uh, says manager Callum Davidson after the side knocked out the favourites Hibs in the semi final on Saturday evening. Goals from Jason Kerr, Sean Rooney, and Craig Conway sealed the victory for the Perth side to put them through the League Cup final against Livingston on February the twenty eighth. Um, an angry Jack Ross, he kind of hit out as well and said that. The way his Hibs team lost 3-0 obviously wasn't the greatest. I think he had a little spat with the media as well afterwards as well. This is uh, the second painful hand in defeat in three months for his Hibs side, Anthony. Um, obviously bowed out in October against uh, Hearts in the Scottish Cup from last year. Uh, there's a bit of a hand in hoodoo hanging over Jack Ross, isn't there? Yeah, it's a bit of a concern from a Hibs perspective. Um, <clears throat> I mean, losing to Hearts obviously cut deep with the supporters. They were they see Hearts as a championship team. Hearts obviously are a championship team. I think most people looking at it objectively would say Hearts and Hibs, there's very little between them in terms of quality of squad at the moment, but fundamentally Hearts are a championship team and that's how it was framed as Hibs losing to championship Hearts. And then on top of that, they go and lose another game where they're hot favourites as this, I think, third place team, uh, third place in the league against a team in the bottom six. Um so to lose to two teams who are ranked beneath you, that's in successive semi-finals within three months of each other, that's going to jar with supporters because uh, fundamentally cup runs are the things that people remember, they're the things that people talk about in 10, 20 years' time. And I think had they lost 2-1 in extra time, there would have still been a fallout from this. But the fact they've been absolutely battered and lost 3-0 is painted a particularly grim picture in the aftermath. And I think um, it, it just sort of sums up the, the quirky nature of football. I mean, Jamie Murphy's chance goes in or any of the other chances Hibs had in the first half, and they probably go on and win that game comfortably, and everybody's, from a Hibs perspective, is looking forward to a final, and they're sitting third, fourth in the league, looking at finishing in the top four for the first time, or the, the second time in the last 10 years, and in a cup final. And everything's hunky dory, and then they go and implode around half time, completely lose their way in the second half, and then you've got this massive backlash where people are now certainly on social media, which is the only way you can judge fan reaction at the moment because they're not allowed in the stadium. There is a big groundswell of anti Jack Ross feeling. I mean, in my view, I think that's unfair. I think when you look at what Jack Ross has done over the past year at Hibs, it's generally been good. He's taken them from where Paul Heckenbottom left them, which was basically in a relegation battle, and he's brought them back into the top four. And barring a serious collapse in the closing months of the season, they will, I mean, I'm saying that Livingston are the danger now to Hibs place in the top four. If Livingston maintain this form, then they will finish in the top four. I suppose the question is, can Livingston maintain it? And I would be very surprised if they can do enough to knock Hibs or Aberdeen out of the top four. But certainly if Hibs have any sort of hangover after this, then their top four place will be in jeopardy. And that's when there will be serious questions asked of Jack Ross. I know there's already serious questions in some quarters because in the eyes of many, the two cup semi-finals are unforgivable, unacceptable. I don't necessarily go along with that. It's obviously two bad results and questions have to be asked. But 
I think when you look at the two teams that were up against St. Johnson, they're a decent side. As much as they're in a bit of a rut, they are capable of beating anybody in the league on their day. And equally, Hearts showed against Celtic in the cup final that they're a decent side as well. So when you take the two games in isolation, you can see why Hibs lost to both teams. But when you put it together as the cumulative, the cumulative effect of losing two semi-final uh, ties to teams that Hibs would have gone in as favourites for both, then it does uh, paint a pretty bleak picture and there will be a fallout. And it's going to be hard for Jack Ross to win over certainly some of the Hibs supporters after this. Yeah, I mean, I don't think by any means, Stephen, that his, his job's at risk at, this, at the present moment anyway. Like Anthony says, it doesn't look good that he's lost these two semi-finals. This is a Jack Ross show that we were not touting, but he was up there to be one of Neil Re- Lennon's replacements at Celtic. Someone see, I, I read this on Twitter at the weekend after that result, and it said Jack Ross is the most overrated football manager in Scottish football. Would you agree to maybe some extent that he is a bit overrated getting, like, recommended for the Celtic job after Neil Lennon? I mean... <sighs> there's no silverware coming Easter Road this season I, I, I specifically remember saying not a chance is he good enough for the Celtic job and I stand by that I, I, like I'm not having a go at Jack Ross and I think I think the the, the kind of the backlash that he received on social media is, is, is kind of too two pronged and I agree with one prong but I do, don't agree with the second one. So the one the one thing that people are sort of levying at him is that in big games, his teams never turn up. The tactics are wrong. The the way the, te- the team's set up and the, uh, like those things you, c- you can levy at a manager. If, if those are the things that you truly believe that that is the reason that Hibs aren't winning all these games or all these big occasions, then, then that's great. But I'm 35 years old and from pretty much apart from the, the their their day in May where where they won the Scottish Cup and and I genuinely thought that that would potentially turn this around. Hibs as a football club have have got not a bottle merchant mentality or anything like that. But when it comes to big occasions and for for a club like Hibs and Hearts, the big occasions are all are, are mainly cup competitions and derbies. Hibs have had a terrible terrible record in my lifetime in the derbies and haven't been great in the Cups. I mean, it took them over 100 years to win the Scottish. They, they've done marginally better in the League Cup. But I, I just don't really get where this this kind of uh, Jack Ross has turned us into bottle merchants. I mean, I'm not being funny, guys. Like, and, and again, this is not me saying this with my heart's hat on. I'm saying this purely if you look at statistics and look at the way that, that results have gone for Hibs over the last 20 years, say, they... they quite often don't turn up when the, on the big occasions. They've had some great players, some great teams throughout the years. I mean, you look at the the, the Fletcher, Riordan, O'Connor, Scott Brown times, how that how that team didn't bury hearts for 10 derbies in a row and get to a Scottish Cup final or a League Cup final. Well, they, they eventually got to a League, League Cup final under John Collins, obviously, but they, they weren't consistently doing anything. So it does. It, 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 to me, as an outsider looking in, I look at that and go, it doesn't matter who's in charge. It doesn't matter what players you've got. It, this mentality issue just, just seems to linger over Hibs and seems to hang over them like a fog. And to me, it, it's going to take something miraculous to change that. And whether Jack Ross is the guy to be able to do that or not, it remains to be seen. Is that... The period, when, so the period when Hibs have had the best mentality was that four-year period where they had Alan Stubbs and then Neil Lennon. People will say yeah. Alan Stubbs did not get them out of the league in these first two years, which is fair. That's absolutely correct. But equally, Alan Stubbs built a team, a Hibs team, that was capable of going toe-to-toe with any team in the country on its day and beating them in big games, in cup games, in cup semi-finals, and obviously in the cup final against Rangers. Some people at Easter Road will not have Alan Stubbs back because he failed to get them promotion out of the league. The league was the bread and butter. But by the same token, Alan Stubbs used to go, he'd beat Aberdeen. He had a great record against Hearts. He had a great record against Rangers. He got to cup semi-finals. He got to cup finals. He got to two cup finals in the one se- in his final season. Probably should have beat Ross County. And then they had that mistake from Liam Fontaine at the end that cost them in the cup final, in the league cup final. And then obviously they made amends by winning the Scottish Cup. But even that wasn't some enough, enough for some Hibs supporters who claim that because he didn't do well enough in the league, he was a dud manager. But then on the other side of the coin, 
you have people who won't accept that Jack Ross is doing well on the basis that Jack Ross has fallen short in the supposed big games, the games against the, the Aberdeens, the Hearts, the Rangers and Celtic. I accept he's fallen short in those departments. However, Jack Ross is on course for potentially Hibs' best ever points tally here at the moment. They're already two points ahead of where Neil Lennon's team were three, four years ago at this stage in the season. And Neil Lennon's team posted a record points tally in the Premiership. So you've got two sides to this. It's This is the bit where some supporters want cup glory and couldn't give a shit about the, the league. Others want consistency in the league and the cup's a bonus. Uh, but sh- surely, surely, there's a, <laughs> surely there's a middle ground, though. There's a middle ground. It's no feast or famine. Like It shouldn't be that we want a manager that turns up against Rangers, Celtic, Hearts and Aberdeen and then in cup games, but we're no bored about the rest. Like, yeah, surely there has to be a balance. Like, I agree with you. I think if you look at purely from statistical point of view of points gained, then Jack Ross has done a great job. But you speak to 100 Hibs fans, and I'm telling you now, 60 of them will tell you that he's not good enough and that the style of play is not great. And that because the, the way things are at the moment, when you aren't able to get to games, the, the big games for Hibs, the, Hib, the Celtic game, the Rangers game, the Aberdeen game, those are the televised ones. Those are the ones that are, are that most people are watching. So these are, at this moment in time, the games that matter. Whether that's right or wrong, that's not how a football club should be run. Like, but I can I can see where the fans are coming from. And, and, and that, to me, doesn't necessarily mean that Jack Ross is a bad manager. But what the Hibs fans are blatantly looking for is a guy who can still... 85% of the time beat a Motherwell or beat a, a St Mirren and maybe can 50% of the time beat a St Johnston home or away. But then when it comes to the games against Rangers, Celtic, Aberdeen at this moment in time, they want a guy who's going to go toe-to-toe with these teams and, and, and actually have a go and, and turn up because that's oh. that's the biggest thing. It's, in it's that not case, that there's a guy beat. about to become available probably in the next four or five months. His name's <laughs> Neil Lennon. <laughs> exactly. he, he was the last man that did that at Hibs. Like him or load him, he was the guy that did that at Hibs for certainly the first, certainly in his second year. I would still argue that his first year when he won promotion wasn't a classic by any stretch. But even then, he had good cup runs. He beat Hearts in the cup and uh, he gave Aberdeen a really good game in the semi final. The Scottish Cup probably should have won that as well. But certainly in the second season, when they finished fourth, they should probably have finished second that year. And they played with personality, they played with exuberance. They played with passion, and I think that's what the Hibs supporters want. But unfortunately for Hibs, they weren't able to, as soon as they lost McGinn and McGeoch and Scott Allen, they weren't able to sustain that, and Neil Lennon wasn't able to remedy the problem, and it all sort of unraveled. But I think fundamentally, what Hibs fans crave is that period that they had under Stubbs and Lennon, where the team was swashbuckling generally, it had a bit of bravado, a bit of bullishness. And if you put Hearts or Rangers on the other side, Hibs would fancy themselves and invariably would come out on top. And I think that's what the supporters are missing just now. They know they'll probably beat Motherwell. They'll probably beat Kilmarnock in a league game at Easter Road. They'll probably beat St Mirren. But when Aberdeen come to town, they're found wanting. When Hearts come to town, a weak Hearts in comparison to recent years, Hearts are still turning them over. I think that's the problem Hibs fans have got. And I understand that. I accept where people are coming from and why people are angry about Jack Ross and the way things are going. But I do have sympathy in the sense that being in the top four for Hibs should not be taken for granted because, to be honest, they've only finished in the top four once in the last decade and they've only finished in the top... They've not finished in the top three since 2005 and they're on course to potentially do that. Yeah, I just want to jump in and obviously this this comment that's coming as well, saying that Hibs are a bit of a Scottish Spurs about them. They don't win much. People respect them and their achievements. They play well, but they've got an empty trophy cabinet. Just a nice club. Um, is the reason, Stephen, that their trophy cabinet is maybe empty bar the Scottish Cup win that they done in 2016, I think it was, um, because there's so much pressure on them now when they get to Hamden. It's been, they've had so many slip-ups. I mean, even just like we say at the weekend there, was there just too much pressure on the, the players going in, missing those chances, and then all of a sudden St Johnston take those chances? Obviously there's pressure on St Johnston as well, but because of the history that Hibs have got at Hamden, there's that added pressure on top of them. I mean, you could see the emotion in Poach's face as well. I mean, there, there clearly was a lot on the line for the players. Um. I mean, potentially, yeah, but uh, th- this is the point that I was kind of making earlier, that th- there's, there seems to be a, a deep-lying mentality issue there rather than anything else, because if you look through it player for player, like, 
how many of those guys on the park have come through and are Hibs through and through? They're, they've come through the academy. Like you maybe got Porteous, maybe Hanlon. The rest of those guys are, are guys that have been brought in. And this, this is what I'm saying. In the years gone by, Hibs have had teams full of good players. Like not all of them came through the, 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 the famed academy. But there always seems to be this, this mentality issue, this sort of mental block of when they get to Hamden, they seem to crumble. But if I was a manager that was in charge of the Hibs, I would be like, I would be saying like bringing in some sort of psychologist or something, saying, why, why is this affecting Paul McGinn? Paul McGinn, who's played at St Mirren, like why, why is he being pulled into this Hibs hoodoo or whatever you want to call it? Like, I, I agree. In this circumstance, when they went up against St Johnston. And then obviously you've got previous cup finals where they've played Ross County, and they, they played Livingston 2004, and, and they've not turned up when expected to turn up. I, I just think that that is a mentality issue. And it's a mentality issue, not with Jack Ross or that, that group of players, with the club. I think the club... But again, I think Callum Davidson probably was quite clever in that game because... Yeah, they rolled their luck in the first half and Hibs had a lot of very, very good chances. But he knew... With, with guys like Witherspoon and the team, the quality of delivery that he can provide, that they were going to get chances. And, and guys like Jason Kerr are so strong, big and strong and good in the air. Um, that I just think he, he, he probably thought if we can frustrate these guys, they might crumble. And that might have been like, it's, it's the same sort of equivalent of if you go to Parkhead or Ibrox and you can get the crowd turning. There was no crowd there just now, but within the the players heads what you said David is, is probably spot on in terms of that mentality there oh no we're going to do this again eh? we're just this is going to happen to us again and yeah. that might be that might be something that's playing on their minds eh? you're automatically going in one nil down straight away if that's how you're, you're entering it uh, right, moving away from the, the semi-finals um, if we touch on a couple of the games that were being played we'll start at Ibrox where it finished Rangers 5 Ross County nil. Ryan Kent Philip Hillander Joe Aribo they got them 3-0 up by half time uh, Ryan Jack and Connor Goldson also scoring as well County struck the woodwork um, before the after the break sorry this was Stephen Gerrard's 150th game in charge, Anthony. Now, we've talked about other managers. Um, I mentioned, obviously, it was maybe a bit of risk appointing Stephen Gerrard, but, I mean, what an appointment he's turned out to be for Rangers. Fair enough, it has maybe taken, what, two, three seasons to get where they are now? But in the long run, if he can stick in that seat at Rangers, then they look unstoppable, don't they? What an appointment Gerrard's been. Yeah, I've spoken about him before. I, even when he wasn't winning trophies, I still thought he was doing a really good job at Rangers every time he... I saw Rangers play, I thought they are a quality team. They weren't always getting the results that their play maybe merited in terms of they probably there was games where they maybe weren't clinical enough and they were letting teams off the hook. But you could see they were on a different level to most other Scottish teams with the exception of Celtic. Um, now they've just added that extra bit of steel and resilience and probably ruthlessness and they've, they've just gone to another level and nobody can cope with them at the minute. They're just... Now they've got themselves this massive cushion in the league. They're just freewheeling towards the title. I mean, there's maybe a month ago, you might have still had that wee nagging doubt. Are they going to crumble when it gets to the sort of the home straight? But they're now that far ahead where even if they did crumble, they'd probably still win the league. The, the, I don't think it's possible for them to throw this away now. Um, they, they probably will have a wee lull at some point, I'm sure, where they, they drop points, maybe lose a game or whatever. Or a couple of games just because there's no there's no pressure on them. They're just they're absolutely drifting towards glory. But to be fair to them, that's another they had a little sticky patch maybe over the past months where they were sort of grinding games out, maybe not at their best against the likes of Hibs, Aberdeen and Celtic. But then they're they've just gone through the gears again on Saturday and absolutely dismantled Ross County and th there's no way they're gonna throw this title away and and even Gerard these I mean, as is always the case with a Celtic and Rangers manager, though, you're only as good as your last season in terms of Steven Gerrard can win this league. But then all of a sudden, he's going to have to prove himself all over again next year against whoever is the new Celtic manager. And whether that's Rafa Benitez or whoever, um, Sean Maloney, if Celtic suddenly get their noses in front in August, September time, then suddenly Steven Gerrard is no longer the messiah. He's the guy who's under pressure and could potentially lose his job. So that's just the nature of working in Glasgow. There's only room for one successful manager in that city. So as things stand, Steven Gerrard looks untouchable. But the challenge now for him is to see out 
this season and then build on it next season. That's what will really, I mean, it won't define whether he's a good manager or a bad manager because for me, he's proven that he's a good manager. But in terms of whether he is able to build a legacy, a, a sort of long period of dominance at Rangers, a lot's going to hinge on how next season starts, both at Rangers and across the city at Celtic, depending on what way they go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, moving on to Petodre, it finished uh, Aberdeen 2, Motherwell 0. Tommy Hoban's header gave Aberdeen an interval lead after Motherwell were reduced to 10 men. Uh, Andrew Considine added a second for the host late on as well. Um, Derek McInnes, he was on the Sugarly Peg Club last week, Stephen. Um, that's a much needed three points for him, isn't it? I feel like I'm constantly fighting Derek McInnes' corner. I think I, I should get a job with his agency or something like that. Like this is, but nah, I think, yeah, it was a much needed win. Um, not and that moves him up to third place as well now in the league, that win. So. Yeah, well, this is, this is it. They, they had a couple of games in hand on Hibs. Uh, that was one of them, obviously, at the weekend. If they can win their other game in hand, they, suddenly they, they, they then look comfortable. This is what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's like swings, it's constant, constantly changing position in this this weird season that we're having and it, as, as Anthony said earlier unless you're Rangers or at this moment in time Livingston everybody seems to be winning two then losing one and drawing and it's like there's nobody getting a massive run a run a consistent form but Derek McInnes I, I, I've got no doubt that he, he won't have been overly bothered about the fact that one guy decided to steal the bed off the sheet off the bed in the spare room and write in red paint Derek out or whatever it was that, but at the same time, I think there is a growing, like again, as, as Anthony quite rightly pointed out earlier, that social media is, is all we've got at this moment in time to gauge support our like feelings and things. And there, there, there is definitely a groundswell of Aberdeen fans who are not Derek McInnes' greatest fan. And even the ones who are not vocal about it, as I said to you, I know quite a few Aberdeen supporters, and the ones I know and speak to, pretty much are of the opinion of he should go or if he does go that's 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 okay like so it's it, it's no that he's that they're vocal against him but the, the, he doesn't really have the back end of anyone else and i just find that bizarre because of the, the, the exact reasons that we've spoken about earlier in terms of the hibs job the aberdeen manager and look look at how consistent they have been in the league over the last couple of years and we, again we spoke about this in back in october or, or november that if, as a Hearts or a Hibs fan, you would bite your arm off for that sort of consistency in the league. But again, football and football supporters, they want moments. They want moments. That, when you look back on football in 20 years' time, you're not going to look at, oh, remember, remember that four years in a row that Aberdeen finished second or third? Like They're not going to remember that. They're going to remember going to Ibrox and winning, like getting a Scottish Cup final, like days out and things like that. Aberdeen just don't seem to have had that under Derek McInnes, so that might be one of the reasons. They get to numerous cup finals, but they, they, they got hammered in all of them, apart from the League Cup one. And I just think that, as I said, uh, familiarity breeds contempt sometimes, and, and that might be the reason that they, they are kind of, he's under a bit of pressure up there. But, listen, if they finish third, which they probably will, it's, it's where they should be. It's... It's again, it's just a bit of a blah, a bit of a kind of nothing season. Eh? Yeah, I mean, it... you look down the Scottish League table just now and all the way in at the Championship and even League One, there's very few sets of supporters that are genuinely satisfied at the moment. And I think that's probably reflective of the wider world issues. Everybody's in a pretty grim place with in terms of the pandemic. People are desperate to get back into football stadiums. They're missing the football. And to be honest, the game's... I've touched on this before. Watching football on TV or through your uh, through your computer is pretty uninspiring. And you're probably finding if you were in the stadium watching some of these games, they're maybe a bit more enjoyable than they look on TV. And I think fans are probably um, judging teams a little bit more harshly than they would if they were in the stadium enjoying the moment. There's probably a, a lot of there seems to be a lot of frustration and anger out there just from the general public in terms of. Even if you look down in England, no manager seems safe from criticism. One defeat and people want the manager out. And I know it's for some people it's always like that, They've got short fuses and what have you, but it seems especially bad at the moment in terms of knee-jerk reactions to even conceding a goal now. You look on Twitter and a team concedes a goal, they want the manager sacked, they want the defender subbed. It's like it's just so intense and irrational. 
And I think there's a, a danger that unless your team is absolutely motoring and has no faults, which is pretty much Rangers and Livingston, then you're fair game for all forms of criticism at the moment. And I have a lot, in that regard, I have a lot of sympathy for every football manager and every player at the moment trying to play through the pandemic because people will be sitting in their living rooms thinking it's easy, thinking, oh, their footballers are well played, they should be able to play in all conditions. But this is an incredible situation they're being asked to... They're basically being put out there in the middle of a pandemic. They're going through the same difficulties in terms of their home life. They can't go out for meals. They can't go out and do normal things that everyone else can't do. All they have is they're going to football and they're expected to turn up and perform at the peak of their powers when they've been programmed to play in front of a large crowd or certainly a few thousand people throughout their careers. It's inevitable that the standard is not going to be as high as what it would be if there's a crowd and a sense of occasion. And so in that regard, I have mass... I mean, you look at what's happened to Celtic. I know people will say it's excuses, but there has to be a large degree of that is down to the fact there's no fans in the stadium. And the way that Liverpool have dropped off down south, Juventus even in Italy, they've dominated the Italian leagues in recent years, and now they're finding they're getting a run for their money for the title. Clubs are suffering. There's no two ways about it. Clubs are suffering. Players are suffering. Managers are suffering. And they're just getting an absolute battering from their supporters because their supporters are frustrated. Their supporters are angry with the way the world is at the moment. It's just one big toxic, angry environment. And people are probably being overly harsh on footballers and managers in general. I'm not saying managers shouldn't be criticised during the pandemic. I'm not saying footballers should be excused for falling short with their performances. But I just feel some of the backlash that certain managers and players are getting at the moment is a little bit over the top. And I think a lot of that's to do with just the fact that people are so unhappy in general at the moment across the board. Yeah, I get that, Anthony. Everything you said, me absolutely spot on. Um, as we moved down the championship, there was a bit of a shock result, Stephen. Um, it finished Hearts 2, Wraith Rovers 3. A bit of a comeback on for the Jambos there. But, I mean, your expression there said it all, mate. What did you make of that game? To be honest, it was it was not good. It was not good viewing. Um, hearts were so slack. They, I mean, they, I, have to, I have to say a lot of credit has to go to Wraith Rovers because, and not I'm not making any excuses for Hearts. Hearts were very very poor. But Wraith, if you look at the situation that Wraith had been in, in terms of they hadn't they hadn't really trained the, the, until the day before the game. John McGlynn, because of the COVID outbreak that they had had, wasn't even sure what squad he was going to have available. So he basically, it was like a Sunday league team. He picked the team basically on the morning of the game on who was available and who was there. And it worked out for him because you had Jamie McDonald was incredible. That's one of the best performances I've seen Jamie McDonald have at Tynecastle. And that says a lot because he was a good keeper for us. Um, I think the boy Kai Kennedy, who's on loan from Rangers, was brilliant. Um, they had a lot of very, very good performances. But Hearts, Hearts just made it far, far too easy for them. They, stepped, they stood off them. There, there seemed to be almost, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but there, there seemed to be a, like a, an expectation that Hearts was just going to turn up and, and perform, like, perform at the levels that they have been and, and get a result. But I think if you look back at Hearts' performances, like take away the results, and the results have been great in the majority of the cases. But if you look at, the, the performances that Hearts have put in this season, out with the Hibs semi-final and the Dundee game at the start of the season, I, I would, I would, I, I can't really remember any other times that Hearts have played really, really well. And I've came away from the game, or came away from watching the game, thinking, yeah, we're really building something here, and, and I think we're onto something. We had a lot of our our first choice players back and available on Saturday, and it was on paper looked a very strong team. But they, they just didn't turn up defensively. They were so, so poor. And I just really hope that, that Robbie Nielsen is looking at that and learning from, from what's happening because we really need to up our gears, definitely. Yeah. I mean, like you touched on as well, um, this was obviously a team that McGlynn picked on that morning because Wraith were effectively closed down because of the, the rash COVID cases that were spreading around the club. Um, a, a little stat for you as well, Stephen. This was Wraith's first win at Tynecastle since December 1993. Um, so there we go. Anthony, uh, Robbie's going to get the, the chance to turn things around because they meet Wraith Rovers again on Tuesday night at uh, in Kirkcaldy. Um, surely he's looking for a huge reaction from his squad now after that defeat at the weekend. 
Yeah, I mean, there's certainly no excuse for complacency on the basis that they've lost at home to Wraith Rovers just a few days ago, and also they lost on their um, not their last uh, away game because they won at Aloha, but the the last game prior to that against Dundee, who I would say are probably a similar caliber team to this Wraith team. Uh, so there, are, there certainly should be no excuse for any sort of complacency that's led to the the type of performances we've seen at Dunfermline and at Dundee earlier in the season. Um, I think the the new striker, if he's, I don't know how fit he is or how ready he is to play tomorrow, but the guy they've signed today, if he can go in, you would hope that he would give them a little bit of a boost, a little bit of extra spark um, and just an extra dimension in terms of potentially causing Wraith some problems. But yeah, that's a pretty alarming result for Hearts on Saturday. It's not the fact they lost the game in itself, it's the fact they were 3-0 down after 50 minutes. That's... uh, I mean, Hearts will lose games. It's the fact this was at home and they were 3-0 down after 50 minutes. That's pretty worrying. And the, the cheapness of the, particularly the second and third goals were horrific, the the ones they lost. Um, so certainly they, they do now really appear to have a problem defensively. And uh, it's, it's not individuals. I think it's a, the unit. There's no cohesion there. They just, they look all at sea at certain times or... Uh, to be fair, a lot of the goals they've lost have been down to individual bits of madness, like the one where Andy Irvin brought it down in his box a couple of weeks ago and the boys just banged it in. But the, they need to sort things out at the back. Going forward, they're fine. I know they didn't score until they were 3-0 down on Saturday, but they're fine. They've got Ginelli, they've got Boyce. Naismith will still chip in with goals. He's not playing at the level that he was playing at previously, but he'll still chip in with goals. Walker, although his form's not been great, will chip in the goals, and they've got goals from a bit deeper from the likes Andy Irvin and Kingsley. So they'll, they'll score enough goals. The problem Hearts have got at the minute is keeping them out because they could score two or three goals tomorrow night, but you wouldn't bargain on them keeping a clean sheet. And that's the the issue they've got at the minute, even with Craig Gordon between the sticks. So this is this need- is what I don't I don't understand. So they've obviously made it quite publicly known that they were going to go for a target man striker, that, that that's what that's what Robbie thought was was missing in this team. Obviously he's brought in Gary Mackay Stephen, which is a great signing and probably a position that we did need to strengthen. But I think anybody who's watched Hearts for any length of time this season can see the problem is we cannot find a defensive unit that works cohesively. And it's it's widely regarded that Michael Smith and Stephen Kingsley are two of the best fullbacks that we've had like in recent times so to me that looks that I, I, I wouldn't want to blame it solely on these guys but I've said I said this a couple of weeks ago I don't believe that Hearts have got a centre half at this moment in time who is good enough to play for a club like Hearts I just think that guys like Berra and and, uh, and Halkett have, have come with big reputations obviously Berra has been a great player for Hearts in the past but I just think that that, that now I would be looking to replace them and I'd be looking I would have probably looked in January to try and get someone even just someone on loan because Pepescu came off the bench on Saturday nowhere near good enough you can see why Berra's been playing so to me he's strengthened again today and he, and I would I would guess that it's probably cost us a reasonable wage to get this guy in because he, he's, he scored goals wherever he's been so that's great but I don't. I don't think we were crying out for a target man striker at this moment in time. Yeah, no, I get that. Uh, as I said, uh, Robbie Nielsen's men get the chance to make up for that defeat this Tuesday as they head over to Kirkcaldy to play Wraith again. And there's there's some amount of fixtures actually happening between now and next week. Uh, on Wednesday, Dundee United they host St Mirren. You've got Ross County at home against Motherwell. St Johnston are at home against Aberdeen. Uh, those are all six o'clock kickoffs on Wednesday at quarter to eight. Celtic host Hamilton Ackies. Hibs are at Easter Road against Rangers. That should be a good tie. And Livingston are at home against Kilmarnock. Um, in the Championship on Tuesday so tomorrow night Dundee they are at home against Air United and as we mentioned Wraith Rovers they are hosting Hearts as well on Wednesday um, 
There's uh, one game, Green at Morton against Inverness Cali Thistle in the Championship. And on Saturday, if we look at Saturday's fixtures coming up, Celtic are at home at St Mirren, it's Dundee United against Hibs, Kilmarnock are at Rugby Park against St Johnston, and Livingston are at home against Aberdeen. In the Championship, it's Air United against Alloa on Saturday, Hearts are at home against Dunfermline, Inverness Cali against Queen of the South, Greenock against Arbroath, and Rafe Rovers are at home against Dundee. So there's plenty of fixtures coming up this week, plenty to talk about on next week's podcast. One thing I do want to touch on just quickly before we go, we've got a couple of minutes left. Stephen, you're a Hearts fan, obviously, you've talked about that quite openly. Um, Hearts are quite well fan backed, if you like. They obviously, uh, the supporters contribute to the Hearts quite a bit. Um, Dundee United have now come out this week. They've asked fans to start putting in a second cash injection into the club to assist recovery from the COVID 19 crisis. Can you see why clubs like Dundee United Stature are having to ask fans to contribute? Is that a worrying sign maybe now? I, I would be very worried if I was, yeah, because, like, not because of Dundee United, well, well, yeah, it is because it's Dundee United specifically because they had a, an American owner who came in all singing, all dancing. He was promising them this and promising them that. But to be honest, to be fair to Mark Ogden, he's, he's, he's been quite open since the start of COVID, that they were going to be really badly hit by this. He's never tried to hide any of that. But the fact that he's now saying to the, the fans, right, maybe you guys should start getting involved, to me, that stinks of he's looking to get out. He's looking mm -hmm. to try and reimburse some of his money and, and go. And you would worry that where that would leave Dundee United because they were bankrolled for years by the Thompson family, who obviously then, sadly, Eddie Thompson, when he passed away, Stephen Thompson didn't really have the same appetite for it it was then bought over by by this american guy and I, i'm not really too sure where this would leave them if he was to to, the, to walk away but i would encourage any club who have the kind of fan base to be able to do it i think if you look at the situation at hearts and look at kind of what the fans contribute and i think once the fans are actually on board and, and, are, and are running the show completely then we'll maybe get a better, a better idea of how successful this has been but I think if you just look at the, the added income that Hearts have given to, to the club, um, that alone has probably kept us afloat and kept us kind of kept the doors open. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, times just absolutely flew past. We've touched on as much as we can on this week's Scottish Football in Action. Join us same time next week, half past six, Monday night, for another episode of the Play On podcast. On behalf of myself, David Simmons, Anthony Brown and Stephen Collins, thank you all for watching and we'll catch you same time next week. <laughs>